Welcome, 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 the viewers of the YouTubes. Um, I have adopted the, the new moniker for work in my computer and, uh, and work in the, the Google Plus Hangout. Uh, I've now dubbed it the Far Squeaker forevermore. Uh, and that's what it's going to be. So, so here I am sitting at the Far Squeaker. And this is what allows me to communicate across the realms with my fellow philosophers, Keith and Vince. Please, gents. Um, give a wave. Tell them how great you feel tonight. I'm ready. I'm ready for my people to take their rightful place. Yeah. Okay, so good. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we're we're into chapter six now, people. So six out of seven in the grand tome of Thankwall, um, and in the fourth out of well, maybe I shouldn't reveal that there's only five tomes in the end times, but I guess I just did. So there. <laughs> uh, we had a momentous end to chapter 5 and that ended with the destruction, the utter destruction of Lustria and of virtually all of class clan pestilence in doing that um, although we seem to feel that some lizard men have jumped into the sky on floating pyramids so some of them has escaped perhaps to return at a later time um, but uh, I guess there was another revealing of the of the great destructive powers of the of the Skaven as they actually in fact did eventually blow up the moon like they started to do and started to gear up for at the beginning of this book. But because this is the end times, we are on to chapter six and we're gonna turn our attentions back to where it gets the most heated, and that is in the Empire. Um, and we finally after all of this long build-up that's gone over four books, are going to see Archaon on the march at last. And in the early goings of Archaon's march down towards the Old World, there, of course, would have to be some involvement by the Skavemen, wouldn't there? So, Absolutely. maybe, uh, Vince, if you're comfortable with opening up the chapter and tell us how it begins. I would love to, Absolutely. So we begin with Archaon's mighty fleet landing on the in the Straits of Kislev, uh, unopposed. In short order, he brings his entire massive host, the largest army Chaos has ever seen, uh, into order. Such is his will that you know he can just control the Chaos. I find it ironic that uh, the master of Chaos, their chosen, is in fact a force of order amongst their people. But at any rate, he uh, he controls them, and they begin marching. And the Skaven take note of this massive horde coming toward them, and uh, Screech Vermin King, the uh, the Vermin Lords, or the head of the Vermin Lords, as it were, uh, he basically realizes that the game has changed, and that their original plan isn't going to work out exactly as they they wanted to. Um, Basically, once the plan of the Skaven had been to literally consume all of the free peoples, the living peoples of the world, to, to take claim the world for their own before Chaos could get it, and once the Skaven had control of basically the entire world, Chaos would be forced to accept them as equals, which is what the Vermin Lords are aiming at here. I think they're trying to get on the same footing as the Chaos powers. Um, unfortunately... They, uh, Vermin King sees that, you know, this really isn't going to work. Their, the Chaos Force is too big, and their power has spread too far already. And in traditional Skaven fashion, he realizes that the only way to survive is to, uh, to bend the knee and feign some weakness for a little while. Um, and so Screech and Thankful and Bone River, uh, who are our teleporting sort of protagonists of this story as they can kind of, because of Skitter Leap, be anywhere they want in the world anytime. They Skitter Leap their way up into the, uh, the midst of the Chaos Army, and it takes them a couple days of walking to get through the host. So, like, that should tell you how big of an army we're talking about here. Like, they're just walking through the army. And, of course, Bone Ripper's there, and, you know, he keeps people at bay, but Thankful is, is very afraid. Uh, only the shadowy form of Screech Vermin King uh, behind him keeps him sort of 
confidently striding forward. And none of the Chaos people actually know consciously that Vermin King is there. He's sort of completely cloaked himself in shadow. And he's just sort of an ominous presence keeping everything away. And finally, they come before Archaon. And they, uh, and Archaon is there with uh, Kairos, Fate Weaver, the sort of most potent and favored of Zinsha, a lord of change. And Thankwell basically says, you know, O oh, mighty Archaon, Lord King of the North, most honored by the gods. And so he basically starts his little prepared speech to prostrate himself, and then Kairos pipes up from his two heads and is like, hey, wait a minute. There's some chicanery going on here, and I'm I am like, don't be fooled. And he sort of waves his hand, and being a, a very hyper-powerful spellcaster, undoubtedly one of the most potent. We keep running into the most potent spellcaster in the old world. You know, we have Teclis and Mazdamundi, and now this guy. But all these guys are vying for the title. Um, you know what? I kind of think of it akin to the false claims that everybody in every different town across the North America claims to be the best pizza in the world. Sure, absolutely. The best cup of coffee, right? Yeah. There's a bunch of those everywhere. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Um, it could also be like we mentioned uh, Game of Thrones earlier. It could also be like the kings, right? There's like 17 kings of, of Westeros, but only <laughs> not all of them live up to the title. They all got a claim. Um, yes. So, at any rate, um, he waves away the Vermin King's uh, shadow spell and sort of reveals him to everyone, and all the Chaos people are very taken aback. Oh my. Except for uh, Archaon, who of course is unmoved, because he's, you know, he is eternally the stoic, unmoving, uh, ever-chosen. And basically, you know, the Lord of Change is all, oh, it's deception and blah, 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 and he's trying to kind of turn this against whatever, uh, and Archaon is just like, Bip, hold, all right, and he just, that's it, he just kind of says hold, it kind of gives him the idea of, like, all right, keep going, I don't care. And, uh, you know, Vermin King stands beside Thankful, pats him gently on the head again as his most favorite pet, and kind of gives him the push on the butt like little Cindy Lou Who, and, uh, and Thankful just starts up again. Oh, mighty Archaon, Lord King of the North, just reading from his prepared script. And in short order, basically, he the Skaven bind themselves to Chaos and basically throw their lot in with uh, Archaon and the legions of the Everchosen. Yeah. One thing I thought that was pretty momentous here is with Vermin King himself. Who he's the he's the top of the ladder of all of the Skavendom, I guess, in a way, because he has already proclaimed himself above the council and he's clearly the leader of all of the vermin lords themselves. But yet, he himself, in this scene, gets down on a knee in front of Archaon to show his supplication. It's a pretty big deal, yes. I thought. Absolutely, it's a good point. Well, but I of course... That, oh, go ahead, Keith, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think in, ter in terms of how we perceive getting down on one knee as a sign of subservience and, and obedience if you will, um, but to the Skaven, it's just, it's all show, so it's not, I, like, it is a big deal in that he is trying to show that he's subservient, but really, he's not letting go of any of his power. He's just really doing this as a delay tactic until the Skaven have gathered more power to themselves. He can clearly intend to overthrow Archeon and, like, carve out a bigger slice of the pie for, for the Skaven and the Horned Rat himself. Yeah, I suppose so. You can kind of uh, make that akin to you know, saying I promise with my fingers crossed behind my back kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what he's saying. Well, his horns were crossed when he, when he <laughs> swore, so that's, that's the trick. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. All right. So, so this, of course, is all happening right on the north coast of the Empire. Um, but the Empire, the last time that we left them, um, no one was getting a hole blown in it. Um, but even if we cast ourselves back even further to the Glotkin book, we had uh, left Altdorf in a barely hanging on by their fingernails kind of situation. Um, so maybe Keith will, will turn to you to tell us about the, the state of the Empire and especially Altdorf right about here. 
Certainly. Um, yeah, so the Empire is in complete dire straits. I mean, Marienburg is completely overrun with plague. Uh, as you said, Kieran Null is a, a stinking crater in the ground. Uh, Talheim is just a cesspit from where um, the Magath Lords left that. And then Althor had like been partially torn into the realm of Nurgle, and it's still uh, really just not recovered from that at all. And even though uh, Karl Franz as, as uh, the Empire has, uh, as the Emperor has returned, um, he's barely hanging on by a thread. So at this point, the Skaven have also completely besieged Althor, and you know they, there's really nothing they can do. Um, the Empire or the Emperor uh, wants to. Uh, he's just thinking of, of his people, right? So he wants to evacuate the city, get out of there, and head down south. Um, now, a couple of days before the Althorf gets completely overrun, uh, Valtem, the Herald of Sigmar, and Gregor Martak, who is the Grand Patriarch of the Colleges of Magic, uh, they've kind of been touring around. We haven't really come across them much since, uh, uh, I guess it must have been the Gash. Um, uh, and they've been picking up like a ragtag band of warriors from all over the Empire. And at this point, uh, Valtan has really grown into his role as Herald of Sigmar. Um, he's no longer kind of like the shy uh, blacksmith that he used to be. He's now a very hardened, serious veteran of war and has kind of really come to accept, him, accept his own role as the Herald of Sigmar. Uh, so they lead this ragtag bunch of warriors uh, past the Skaven lines, and they break into Althor. They meet with the Emperor, and there's this kind of iconic scene where uh, Volta kneels before Karl Franz and does, in fact, proclaim him as Sigmar Reborn or Sigmar Incarnate, um, uh, which is a big deal. So this kind of like stirs up the people a little bit, gives them you know a little um, glimmer of hope. So they hatch this plan together, where Martak and Valtan are going to sally forth out of the north disrupt the Skaven lines, and give the Emperor a much-needed distraction to break for the south uh, for relative uh, safety. So they do just that, and you know, it's crazy enough that it just might work. And as Valtan and Martak uh, make their sally forth out of Althor, they come across the Skaven lines, and there's actually a bunch of infighting going on at that time. Um, so they use this to their advantage. They punch through the Skaven lines, create a big fuss, and Karl Franz is able to escape out the back door. So that's all well and good. Um, but the thing is, is that the Emperor, uh, he kind of said, hey, I need you guys. Uh, you are both symbols of hope and uh, you know, individuals of great power within the Empire. I want you to try and you know, cut back around and uh, regroup. Uh, unfortunately, they can't do that. And they keep getting harried and get, keep getting pushed further and further north and eventually they make their way to Middenheim. Uh, now, Gregor Martak is originally from Middenland, and uh, they know that uh, Middenheim is also besieged by the Skaven, so they figure, well, while we're here, we might as well crack a few skulls and uh, help, help out um, the Middenheimers. So they make it to Middenheim, uh, and essentially, again, Middenheim is on this kind of plateau, almost like Talheim was. Uh, and this plateau is riddled with caves. The caves are regularly patrolled by the Empire, but there's also like chimeras and manticores and all, you know, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my, hanging out in there. Um, and there's these four kind of aqueducts leading up. So there's only really four points of entry, five of you include the tunnels going up from Palatine. But the the Empire has has this really well uh, bunkered down. Siege has been going on for a while. So Martek and Valtan, they kind of fight their way up, and then the, um, the Elector Count of Middenland, he realizes they're there, he sallies forth with his knights, they punch a hole through, and they all escape back up to, to Middenheim. Um, and at this point, we get kind of an insight into the Elector Count's state of sanity. Um, but do you guys want to say anything about that a little bit? Yeah, he's a he's a good character that Todd Bringer, and, and, and he's got a little bit of history behind him too. Um, right. but one thing that I want to slip in with here is the one passage I kind of I kind of liked was as was it says as Valken is riding into the gates of Middenheim, he can't help but feel the irony of rushing into two besieged cities within a fortnight. So finds That's himself great. in a similar predicament. Just going from one besieged city to the next. Um, 
Now, I want to talk about Todd Bringer, as you said. Todd Bringer, uh, in general, is he's he's a he's a very well respected elector count in the empire. He's um, had his fair share of wars. He has always taken it upon himself to defend the empire, and is a pretty astute general in all respects. With maybe one failing, and that is that he is just like the beastmen that surround him in the Drakold Forest just grind his gears all the time. And in the past, there was uh, there was this Kazrak who was uh, who was a beast lord, and at one point. Boris Todbringer took out his eye and he became known as Kazrak One Eye. That was at their first meeting. They've had a few other clashes in between, but at another meeting, another time later, Kazrak returned the favor and he took out Boris Todbringer's one eye as well. So they kind of share that same fate. So what is a big, big turn of events here is as soon as Valton shows up with Martak, he only gives him a couple hours reprieve and then summons, summons all of his war council together and effectively, in short, says, um, I got things to do. I'm going to go hunt Kazrak One Eye because it's important that that guy dies. Uh, and now that we have a capable leader here in Valton, dude, you're in charge. I'm taking a few guys. I'm going into the woods. And it's just as succinct as that. It's just as flat as I got my own agenda. I sat here long enough. Somebody else take this. I'm getting out of here. Yeah, it's and, really, uh, he's like he's so far in his delusions that you know Valton and Martak are like, no, Archeon's coming and the Skaven are here and everything's like the world is ending. It's terrible. And Toddbringer's just like, no, 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 they're not Skaven. They're just this new form of beastmen. Once we kill one eye, it'll be fine. Like only I can figure out the plan. That once we kill one eye, all the beastmen will go away, and everything is great. Everything is a beastman problem. Um, and like I guess when all you've got is a hammer, everything you see is a nail. And this guy is just using nothing but nails. Uh, and the funny thing about it is actually he was mentioned in about like three lines, three sentences in Glotkin, where um, what's his face? Uh, Oh, I forgot his name. Oh, Garot's Fume. He's Garot's wandering Fume. through the Drakwald, and uh, the Huntsman, the special character Huntsman from the Empire, he sees them, and he goes to Toddbringer, and he's like, hey, there's this big legion of Chaos Warriors running through the forest. You should do something about it. And again, Toddbringer's just like, oh, that Kazrak one eye. I'll have to go get him. He's up to no good again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, this, uh, this guy, for all his brilliance in the past, he just flips, and, and, he, and he comes up with this plan that he's just going to go charging into the woods with a dozen knights, and that's it. So they actually sally forth a couple score of knights to help him punch through the Skaven siege lines, but as soon as they get through the siege lines, most of the knights turn around and go back up the Falschlag into Middenheim, but Todbringer carries on with his tiny little retinue. Now, he goes out marching for about three days uh, and doesn't really come across much of anything of significance with the Beastmen until he uh, comes across a pack of Ungor and by this time he's all frothing about it. He just wants to kill all the Beastmen. So he charges after these Ungor down some small paths in the forest. Um, slays them all of course but, uh, but his hope is that it's going to lead him to Kazrak which it does but he is not in any kind of a good state to be doing battle from horseback in these small little hunting paths and, uh, and game trails that are in the forest. So he gets assailed by Beastman. And as soon as he hears the volume of the cries coming from out of the forest and the frenetic motion in the woods, he actually snaps back to it and he has a moment of realization where it's, it's the oh shit moment. What have I done to my men? I have just brought them to their doom, and they are going to die here on this path. Um, and, and they're in the thick of it immediately. So there's beastmen clawing all over him, pulling him out of the saddles. Um, he himself gets unsaddled, and he's smashing away at, at beastmen with his, with his rune fang. Um, but poetically, as, as it must, 
because this is a good end times book and it's got to be a good story. Kazrak One Eye does show up, and he makes his appearance there, and we have the 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 sort of the, the circle that goes around the combatants and sort of builds up. You know, all the beastmen form a ring after every other Empire soldier is killed, and Kazrak and uh, and uh, and Toddbringer have a go at each other. And this goes on for a little bit. They they write it out in some epic way, like everybody's getting their licks in, and it goes on for a while. But just when Kazrak thinks that he's got Toddbringer beat, um, and Toddbringer's on his back, he turns the tables by doing a slash at uh, at Kazrak's lower leg, and he tumbles him down, and Toddbringer quickly leaps up, and puts his rune fang right through. Kazrak's other eye, because <laughs> it because we know it couldn't have gone any other way. <laughs> so he drives the rune fang right through his eye, but his triumph is unfortunately very very short lived, because of course all the beastmen that are ringing him, and there's more than a hundred of them here at this point, just bear down on Toddbringer, and that is the end of him as well. So there's the end of our Empire hero right there. Poor Todd Bringer. I, I have to think in some part of his mind, he actually like felt the end was coming. You know, like he just he he's kind of almost like a, a flagellant at that point somewhere in his mind. And he's like, Well, the end is coming. So we're you know, people are we're all gonna die, but I'm gonna get mine before I go. I've got this thing I've gotta do. This is like his bucket list item, right? This is the last thing he's gotta check off before the end. If he goes down fighting and doesn't kill Kazrak, he's just gonna he's gonna feel he's not gonna be happy in the in the other on the other side. So he's just like, well, I this is the guy behind it all. Yeah, totally. No, trust me. All right, and then he goes, you know. But really, he knows that death is coming one way or another. Why not make it worth it and kill his old foe? Yeah, that's a that's a good way to justify that guy's actions. I guess I'd buy that. That's a good yeah, thing. well, I mean, like. In when you think about it, in his mind, he's just single-handedly saved the Empire, because he thinks Kazrak is behind everything, and he killed him. So, you know, he went down like the glorious hero of the Empire, and he saved everybody. Mm -hmm. But, in this chapter, that is, for me, the first of a couple of what-the-heck kind of moments, that whole, that whole segue um, about Todd Bringer versus Kazrak, but, uh, you know, they fit him in every once in a while in these, in these End Times books, so it makes for a good story and a good tale, I guess. So take it for what it is. Um, but as you say, Todd Bringer's attitude that the end is nigh anyway uh, kind of is a good segue into uh, turning our attention back to Archeon as he finally is closing in on Middenheim. Um, Vince, maybe we should pass, pass it back to you to talk about this fella. Absolutely. So uh, basically the same day that Todd Bringer dies, uh, Archaon arrives at his destination, the city of Middenheim. And as they say, the city of the White Wolf knew no dawn that day. So, like, as Archaon's force is so massive and so potent with chaos, it's dragging this big storm with it. All I can think of is, like, if you've ever seen those pictures on the internet of, like, volcanic storms when the ash clouds pop up and there's, like, pink lightning and purple lightning racing throughout it, and it just looks like hell has opened up. That's what's in my mind as I picture this army marching forward. That's the storm clouds rolling over top of them, just chaos unleashed. And um, and so basically, um, he rolls up in a city, and uh, he. Uh, so the first thing that happens is he sort of gets introduced to this clan Skyer guy, uh, Grand Warlord Skrazlik. Skrazlik, yeah, that sounds right. Um, who sort of in charge of this. Um, and basically he says, oh, look, well, you know, I failed to take the city, but it's, uh, you know, it's not my fault. It, it really isn't. Um, and so then, yes, absolutely. He's like, no, this time it's going to work, you know. As always, everything that happened in the past, not my fault, and this time the plan is foolproof. That's uh, that's the story like, of every every like, game in the world ever. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so uh, basically, he sort of recounts the tale of what's happened recently, and he tells Archaon, you know, well, what threw us off is this 
this reinforcement we didn't expect arrived, and it had this big warrior in it who was swinging this hammer, and blah, 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 blah. And he sort of tells this story of Bolton. And uh, this really great moment happens where... I'll just read the exact passage. For a moment, Grand Warlord Skarsnik uh, flinched in terror... Skarsnik, sorry. Flinched in terror as a grating sound came from within Archaon's helm. Yet he raised his snout in bewilderment as he realized that the Lord of the End Times was not cursing in anger, but laughing in cruel amusement. And so the reason Arcan is laughing is because he's come all this way to destroy Middenheim because it's sort of this gateway to the Empire itself. And Valton, the Herald of Sigmar, is here, just delivered to him, which he very much would like to kill that guy. That guy is high on his list of, like, people to you know, X off before he can count himself the victor. And um, so he sort of sends off uh, Skarslik with some orders, and Skarslik feels all good. He's supposed to basically, uh, you know, go in and, and infiltrate um, uh, from below. Um, and uh, what I like here is that we then get a nice little mention of another being watching this exchange, clinging in the shadows beyond the sight of all, that had uh, that had trailed Volton and his army all the way from Altdorf. And so we wonder who is this this strange being? You know, is it like is it one of the vermin lords? Who who is following along, spying on all of this? And so we just kind of get a quick wrap up. Skaven are filling the tunnels and ready to go, but. Before, as the Skaven are filling the tunnels and readying for their assault from below, while Arcana is obviously going to assault from above, uh, this shadowy figure slips in, and uh, we get a nice little cutscene as we learn who exactly is this this mysterious man, or not a man, perhaps. I'll let one of you take that. Yeah, I can't take that, because this is another one of those what-the-heck moments that just drives me a little bit nuts. So, <laughs> Keith, would you like this one? Give us, give us your take on that one first. Sure. Well, so our old pal Technus, he, he, he the shadows his way into a secret chamber underneath the mountain uh, of Middenheim, and in there is this massive flame, and it's the flame of Ulrich. So Middenheim is the seat of the, god, of the empire god Ulrich. And uh, so there's a massive flame, which is Ulrich's symbol, and there is another flame up in the temple in the city above, which is uh, kind of like the doppelganger of this flame, and it's just it's a pale shadow of comparison. So he's in this massive chamber, and uh, Ulrich speaks to Teclis, and says, basically, like, how dare you invade my chamber? What are you doing here? Um, you're nothing but, like, a snake in the grass type thing. And a bunch of, like, ice wolves form from some bones littered around the... Um, littered around the cavern, and just charge Teclis. And, you know, Teclis being the most powerful living mage in the old world, uh, or at least one of them, just kind of takes his staff and smashes them away. And Ulrich is kind of like, oh, I'd like to see you do that a second time. And Teclis is kind of like, I'm not going to have to. And so he takes his staff and he sticks it into the middle of the fire, and the fire just kind of rushes into the staff. And we know that Teclis' staff has, he's already bound um, the, the, the wind of light into his staff. His staff is left by Lilia, who is the schemer of all things, um, and basically snuffs out the winter flame, essentially uh, killing Ulrich. And kind of in his last dying words, Ulrich says, you know, you condemned all of these people, all of my people, uh, to die. I was kind of the last hope. And Teclis, kind of with a, with a heavy um, sense of regret, says, I know, but I've got bigger fish, fish to fry, essentially and then he kind of shadows his way out again. And at the moment that the winter flame is kind of snuffed out, this sense of dread and foreboding um, rushes through all of the Empire men um, in Middenheim as like the, the stubbornness and the bitterness of their god was sustaining them in the face of this unimaginably huge army, and uh, their resolve is just taken away, and they're all kind of spooked at this point. Um, so, Certainly bigger plots going ahead right now. Teclis has essentially killed an empire god, but to what end? We'll find out. All right, so so here's what I want to say about this. Um, what the heck is this guy up to? 
is, is exactly what I thought at this moment. He, at the end of Cain, and we spent the great deal of Cain for, for him manipulating the whole elven race and building it up to the whole point that no matter what goes on here with us elves, chaos is still the great evil and we need to handle it. And the way that we're going to handle it is we're going to dissipate all of those winds of magic and incarnate various other people. Now, obviously, he failed at all that. He didn't quite achieve that uh, the way that he wanted to. But now, is there any other way of thinking about this other than he has just thrown Middenheim in front of Archeon to be taken out of the whimper? Isn't that what he's, what he's kind of done? What are your thoughts on this, Vince? I, I see this as, sure, I see this as, as him playing the same long game he's played since book one. Like, there is, I see no difference in this. He sacrificed his own niece to bring Nagash back, but make sure he wasn't perfect. He needed Nagash alive, but just strong enough. He needed the winds freed and in certain beings, but in the right beings, and he kind of missed on that a little bit, but he did get him out, and he did get him into people to some degree. I mean, I think he's playing at the same game since moment one. He knows that, like, the only thing, like, chaos is coming. And Teclas in his mind firmly believes that armies are pointless because there, we will never have enough troops. There are not enough living beings and dead beings in the world to fight the masses of chaos. And that's, that's what uh, Vermin King was pointing out when he looked into the portal in the Lizardmen Arch, right? He's like, even he was taken aback that there are numbers beyond the counting, right? And he knows that the only way that this is ever going to go down, if, it's, if there's any chance... There has to be champions that are empowered, that are potent enough to stand against the things that the, the few beings that hold chaos together. Because even though chaos's forces are endless, the only way they actually do anything is when they have very powerful, sort of charismatic leaders. And those guys are just far above, as far above mortals as nearly the gods are. And so he needs to manufacture his own supermen to stand against the enemy gods. I think that's just what he's doing here, too. The Flame of Ulrich is just one more tool in that toolbox to start manufacturing the Ubermensch. <laughs> but the reason I could justify his actions and sacrifice in the, in the Gash situation uh, was because he saw Nagash as an opponent to Chaos and and to use as a, as a tool for that. So that one felt justifiable, I suppose. But... Uh, this one's uh, this one's tough for tough to swallow, I think. What he's doing with it? Another he's, he's you can, I think another way you can kind of look at it, and I don't. This, this kind of idea has a lot of holes in it too. Um, but we saw in Cain a lot of gods dying, and now here we see him essentially killing off another god and almost like harvesting them as resources. So I wonder if that has something to do with it as well, that if you if you remove players from the War of the Gods to be in some way weaken uh, the Chaos Gods. So basically killing Ulrich and taking his power before the Chaos Gods can kill Ulrich and take his power. You know, salting the earth almost, denying his enemy resources. All right. Okay, well that's enough about this techless guy. <laughs> Long story short, I think he read the writing on the wall and was like, look, this city's done for anyways. I'm taking the most important thing out of it. Because, like, it was gone. It wasn't lasting. That's him standing over the discussion between Archaon and Scars. Like, he's like, yeah, this place isn't done for. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, there's another being around there that feels the that feels the the sort of sapping of, of Ulrich's flame as well, and that's our, our pal Kairos Fateweaver, who, of course, is the right-hand man of Archaon in the in the opening parts of this. Um, so Kairos feels that power of Ulrich sort of dissipate and, and be released. And that in himself he feels as a signal that, oh, this is it. This is the time. It's on. Let's start going. So he gets into his ritual. He gets all pumped up and starts flapping his wings and begins the great summoning of as many Zinchi demons as he can. Uh, and thus is the opening of the opening of the assault. Um, Skaven got a part to play here too, as you'd imagine. Um, they've put themselves before Archeon, and Archeon has accepted them as a tool that he's going to use. So what he sets the Skaven to do in advance of the assault of his whole army is uh, 
he wants to send him in to plant bombs into the gateways, uh, the four different gateways of the aqueducts that come up into Midnight, so that it can be a free pass for, for his armies. Um, being the tunnelers that they are, and the greatness of the gutter runners, um, they go in through the wormy tunnels of the Flauschlag, and uh, with a few distracting um, skirmishes that go on in the under tunnels, a few of these gutter runners, well, they all actually do get through to their intended targets. So they got four different gateways, as we said, um, and they do eventually get to where they're supposed to be, and they plant their bombs, and then in time, they all go off, or some of them go off. Um, the way that it describes it is the one in the south dissipates and it doesn't happen uh, because the fuse didn't happen properly. Um, and the other one in the west actually blew up, but not properly, so it burned off all the poison gas that was going to be the thing that left the gatesmen um, incapacitated. But in the north and the east, it went successful, uh, just as they had planned to. And, and I guess in, in Skaven measure, 50% is, uh, is pretty good in all respects. That's a, that's a pretty high, uh, that's, a, that's more than a pass rate, I would say. And it's probably Absolutely. all that Arkham was hoping for. <laughs> so when they see that happen, um, those become the two assault points. Uh, the Warriors of Chaos come in from the north, up that passage, and uh, the demons come in from the east and through that passage. Um, now, in the defense of this, of course, it's been left to Valton and Martak to get it organized because Todd Bringer pissed off a few days ago. Um, and Valton takes it upon himself to stuff the gaping hole that is left in the north gate. Um, but Martak, he takes it upon himself to go into the under tunnels and prepare the defense against the Skaven that are rising out of there. Um, so with this all staged, um, Keith, any uh, we're kind of getting to just general buildup of of stuff, fights, and, and, and guys die here. But as we move along into the fighting itself, um, what are some key moments that uh, that you picked out, if any? Um, well, I think one of the one of the things we got to bear in mind here is that, like like you said, Martak and Vulcan were just kind of like shoved into command. And they're, you know, they're foreigners, and they haven't been with the siege, so they're new to the, to the city and the man and all that kind of stuff. And the the um, commanders that are there don't really trust them. Um, so the Empire are pretty slow to respond to any of this stuff. So when the bombs goes off, chaos breaks loose, quite literally. Uh, and uh, Valtan is, is taking the, um, is holding the city, and Martak has some troops underground to defend from the tunnels below. And Skaven, they kind of bombard the tunnels below with a bunch of chaff, just slaves. And Martek kind of realizes, oh, hey, you, they're not deploying their, you know, any of their good stuff, any of their weapon teams or whatever. This is just the distraction. I'm going to take some boys and go upstairs. And as soon as he does that, of course, that's when the Skaven elite hit. So the storm fiends and the storm burn, and they, they roll in and start um, seriously assaulting that. Uh, Valten, though, one of the interesting things about him now is every now and again it mentions that like the light is just hitting him just right, and he's kind of got this this aura, or this halo of golden light around him. So we certainly, you know, see that there's some maybe spark of the divine in him, and that he's certainly blessed by Sigmar. Um, I think one of the most important things that happens here is that when Martak uh, uh, comes out of the tunnels. Um, he's just throwing amber spears everywhere. That's like his go-to spell. He loves it. Um, and at one point, like his troops are just getting completely overwhelmed, and he is just sensed with this, you know, uh, huge feeling of despair and bitterness. And in that bitterness, the last kind of echoes of Ulrich find a kindred spirit in him. And because he's a beast wizard, and Ulrich is, you know, represented by um, the wilderness and wolves and all that kind of stuff, he flows into him and. and basically uses Martek, and it describes him as a weapon fit for a god. So he just starts, like, you know, turning stuff to ice and then smashing them into millions of razor shards and playing all of his enemies, and he shoots up this massive ice wall to give his troops uh, a chance to retreat back into the center. Um, as well as this, one other notable character, 
uh, to show up is Malgor, who is the Crow Father, who was mentioned way back in Glockin, who is a uh, significant figure in Beast Malor. And I see Vince nodding away there. So do you want to describe what Malgor is up to? Yeah, absolutely. I think that didn't this guy first come up in Nagash? Because didn't he, like, lead one of the armies that was originally marching for Sylvania astray or something like that, right? I mean, this he's been building up as, like, this very enigmatic beast man character. Because, yeah, he attacked uh, the city right at where Archon and um, Manfred had showed up to steal the armor of Nagash back. And then, boom, in comes the beast man, right? And uh, yeah, what I remember sure. about him is he began to trail Archon after La Maison Tal. Yes. And all the way through back, so, back to the Empire is where it began to trail him. And he was the force that also... I think he's the force that got into Sylvania eventually as well and had a bump against the dwarves. And both of those armies were forced to retreat. So, yep. so yeah, he was a key figure in all that. So this guy has been around for a while, right? Like, I mean, he is literally since the beginning of the story. I mean, Le Maison, Le Maison Tal is one of the first sort of shots across the bow of the end times, and he's been there. And... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll second with you. This is this was one of my moments for this. So he shows up, and he brings all of his beastmen with him. Right? He just he brings this mighty war herd up against the uh, because at some point here the other gates fall as well. By the way, so the south and uh, west gates that hadn't fallen in the initial assault also fall, and hence allowing additional access into the city. Okay. So that being said. In comes this war herd led by Malagor, and he's just driving them. He is, like, mad with the lust for battle, and he pushes them into the Empire lines. And the problem is he's there before anybody else is really there. The other forces are still, like, at the doors or in small choke points or not even, don't even have the majority of their force there yet. He's in the city. And as a result of that, the Empire is able to turn the vast majority of its swords and guns on the beastmen, and, you know, they talk about Hellblasters just scything their way through, you know, the herd and everything. Uh, we all know from, if we've ever seen, if you've ever seen beastmen on the table, Hellblaster volley guns and other sort of shooting like that are not generally their friends. And uh, so he keeps turning into this big flock of crows and, like, raining death down and kind of re-solidifying, and he's just floating around being this dark omen of death. And that's when uh, our old buddy... And, but he's not really doing much. I mean, his, his men are getting slaughtered. They finally do get into the lines, and, like, some minotaurs do some good work because, you know, those guys are... They're scary, and they're all frenzied and filled with the lust of battle. Um, but for the most part, he's kind of just distracting them, really. Um, and as he sort of reformed and realizes that he, you know, has a, another target he needs to focus on... Um, he takes a big giant spear of amber and ice right through his crow body form and dies. <laughs> like, I, I don't remember there being much more to that. Like, uh, the Grand Patriarch, who is now possessed with Ulrich, sees him, sees what's going on, sees all his men dying, and is like, nope, zap, and kills this guy. Well, I, I, if I remember right, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this was a one-shot, one-kill situation. Am I wrong here? It really was. Yeah. No, you're right about that. They tried to make, they tried to make it out that that Malagor was all kinds of scary and 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 untouchable because he would just come and go out of out of crow form, like he would just go incorporeal and turn into a turn into a flock of crows, and then he would reconstitute himself next to another war machine crew and stabby stab those that war machine crew and then dissipate again and appear elsewhere. But I guess Martak across the field was watching this go on and he's like, oh, I see what your game is. If I just time this right, as soon as you coalesce one more time, I'll stick you with my icy spear. And that's pretty much exactly how that went. Yeah. A lot of, lot of build-up for this guy. You know, four books in, he finally does something and uh, gets killed in one shot. He's yeah. sort of like the apocalypse of bad guys, you know, like apocalypse in the X-Men universe where you spend like 5,000 years plotting and then accomplish nothing. <laughs> He's been at this a while and he did nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and and in the meantime, his uh, his poor beastman followers are getting pummeled by Gal Moraz. Um, Bolton actually rode out first to try to stem the flow of the north gates, but um, there was too much coming in there, so he had to retreat. And and we should say that all of this at this stage of the fighting, effectively, the empire has all retreated with their backs against the Temple of Ulrich, right in the center of the central plaza of the city. Um, so it's all kind of going down right here. Uh, anyway, um, Valton is uh, swinging away with his axe and he's knocking jaws off of minotaurs and he's, you know, pummeling and, and pulverizing those guys. And, of course, at this point, because it's only the beastmen that have committed themselves, the Empire troops are feeling pretty damn good about themselves. Feeling pretty spectacular, in fact. Um, but then it all changes in an instant. You know, that roiling cloud that, that you described as volcano heavy ash and lightning kind of comes down the plaza towards them slowly. And just as casual as a guy coming late to the ball in, in fashionably late fashion, uprides Archeon on his demon horse with the Swords of Chaos all at his back, and he appears. And in that instant, everybody feels it, right? Like all the Empire soldiers just feel that foreboding dread. Even Martak does. And Martak at this point is already imbued with a little bit of Ulrich juice. And uh, so he feels that. Um, but without a rousing, almost Aragorn-esque kind of speech to rally his troops is the only thing that Valton has to offer here. Uh, he effectively, instead of the, instead of rallying the troops and saying, we're going to die here this day, but it's going to be for a good cause, Valton tried us to imbue upon his people that that guy right there, Archeon, is the symbol of the end times. And if we kill that guy, then we win. No matter how many of us die this day, if we kill that guy, it's a win. So uh, how that seems to be enough to get the troops back in order, and uh, and they go. So here it is. <laughs> Keith. Um, yeah. Maybe we can uh, turn it to you here. We got a we got a little bit of lead up. We have an exchange between Martak and and the demons, I think. That's so right. A bit of a tale. Yeah. Or so I'm missing between. Yeah, Mar Martak. Uh, no, you're right. Um, it's we cut away to Martak. He heads over toward the east to confront um, the demons. And so there's these demons. So there's you know fire going off and like some. Uh, some warrior or some soldiers in the empire are getting turned into crystals, and others are warping into spawn and what have you. Um, but then there's a showdown between the two big guys, Martak and Kairos, and they're throwing styles back and forth at each other, uh, and it's not really getting anywhere. One of them's a Lord of Change, and the other guy's a Grand Patriarch, imbued with power of a god. So that's you know that's not happening. Um, but then Martak gets kind of overwhelmed with the savagery of Ulrich and already being a beast wizard. He just launches up Kairos um, by himself and just starts tearing him a new one uh, with his magical claws and his magical jaws. And uh, Kairos isn't much of a fighter, and he's kind of had enough, and he um, flies away to safety, essentially. Um, and then uh, there's a bit of a, a hubbub between uh, the Skaven. They enter. They find some secret tunnels into like the back of uh, the temple of Ulrich where um, the Empire still have the last few bastions of artillery who are kind of allowing some cannonballs and mortar shots into the like massive chaos work, so they can't possibly miss. And uh, a bunch of storm fiends and, and uh, clan rats and storm vermin pop up. And kind of Valton has this split decision, like, do I go straight for Archeon and try and, and finish this, or do I kind of go deal with the Skaven, who he's dealt with before, and he realizes that, you know, they're not going to stick around for a while once he starts cracking heads. Um, so you can deal with them really quickly and then get back to the fighting before anyone ever misses them. Um, so that's what he decides to do. He goes off and he waves his hammer at the Skaven and they get scared and they basically go away. Uh, but in the meantime, the... Um, oh, what's it called? The, the, the head knight, the Grand Marshal? Yes. Yeah, yeah Grand, Grand Marshal. Axel Weisberg. 
Yes, the Grandmaster. Yeah. Thank you. Axel Weisberg. No, that's right. He's the first to go after him. He decides that he'll take on Archeon while, uh, while Valt and Little was occupied. So he runs up and he swings his big war hammer and then he cracks Archeon right across the shield and Archeon doesn't even flinch. And it, like, it describes the hammer blow being so hard that the reverberations nearly uh, knock the hammer out of Axel's arm, but Archeon just isn't phased. Uh, and Archeon thinks, you know what, I, I can end this here. I can just break the resolve of the Empire. So he kind of locks off Axel's arm and basically like shoves his sword through his chest and then rips him straight up, splitting him in half. And this gets the desired effect. And so you've had this kind of flip-flopping of the Empire morale where, you know, everything was good, and then Malagor attacked, and everything was bad, and then we killed Malagor, so everything was good again, but then Archeon showed up, and we're all scared, and then Valken gives a speech, and we're feeling good about ourselves again, and now Weisberg is just split in half, and they've had enough. So they are almost in a full rout at this point. Um, but at this time, Valken is finished dealing with the Skaven, and he marches back, and we kind of get the big showdown that this chapter has been leading up. Yeah, it's a it's an emotional emotional roller coaster for all these empire guys in this battle. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's, it's like a poor one. girl on prom night and her date is late, you know, and, then he finally, <laughs> and then he finally shows up, uh, and and then but but then at the dance he likes another girl, and and then I'm shattered again. <laughs> but then yeah, I, I hope her date wasn't Archeon. That's probably not going to end positively. I would probably should have chosen a better prom date. Maybe. Uh, well, we'll give it up to you, Vince. This is the, you're right, Keith. This is the this is the marquee moment of this of this whole chapter, and we even have a have a nice fresco image here that I'll that I'll show off to you to talk about. There, that's what the build up is all about, kids. These two gents. There you go. Right here. So uh, yeah, we'll give this to you, Vince, if you want to take us through this the moments of this that. Absolutely. So, yes, we have the confrontation of these two mounted warriors. Now, at this point, Bolton is still mounted. He's been riding around, you know, with some knights. But the knights are mostly gone now, and it's just him. And he swings forward, and, uh, you know, Archeon is kind of... They're both, like, charging each other across the, the distance. And Archeon is sort of threatening him and insulting him as he, come down, as he comes upon him. And... So this is where we get the first mention of uh, Uzul, which is the demon bound inside Archeon's blade, who is constantly wanting to be let out. So Archeon's blade has this very, very powerful demon in it, this demon of fury in combat, and it wants to be out and murdering people. But, and, but he knows that once it comes out, it's hard to put away. Uh, it doesn't like to go back in its box. Uh, so this is kind of like the Dark Elf character we had earlier, who would like Hulk out and, you know, and turn into a demon, only it's in a sword. And uh, Volton comes up, and he spurs his horse forward, and he sort of swings Galmaraz with all his might. This is one of the greatest weapons in the old world, if not the greatest weapon ever forged. It's on the cover of the Warhammer book, so I think it's pretty important. It is the war... That hammer symbol is Galmaraz, so, you know, I think that's a fairly relevant thing. And... Uh, he brings it down, and he he once again, you know, uh, uh, Archeon goes to block it with his shield, uh, but this time it uh, it actually like it hits so hard it does give uh, Archeon some pause. It kind of jostles him loose and pushes him kind of out of his saddle a little bit and sets him off balance. And Volton basically has an opening and goes to swing down again, and unfortunately he forgets this. Yeah. He didn't reckon on the fact that Archaon isn't riding some normal horse. He's riding a horse named uh, Dorgar, who is like this chaos mount of chaos mounts, this demon-infused horse that, seeing his master about to get hit, uh, reaches out and bites the neck, the entire neck, out of Valton's horse. This is a bloody chapter, by the way. There are some gruesome deaths. The first, he reversed Conan the Librarian of the Grand Master, and now this. So he bites this horse's neck out, and uh, which of course sends Volton off balance and skittering to the ground. And they both, um, uh, they both, kind of, he falls, he swings up, he sort of hits Dorgar and knocks Tim askew, and uh, 
Archaon then starts hacking at him, and he's kind of like hacking down, cutting through his armor, starting to wound him, and for a moment, Bolton seems like about to fall, um, and then once again, this like golden light kind of blossoms around uh, around Bolton, as he is the Herald of Sigmar, and sort of fresh energy um, and, you know, fills him, and they have this uh, moment where they're about to have this big showdown as now he is empowered by the force of Sigmar against Archaon, Lord of the Everchosen. And that's when we switch over to Gregor Martok's perspective, who in traditional movie fashion is watching this happen from a distance, and he wants to intervene, but he's too slow, it's too far away, and no... And uh, what he sees, he sort of feels this dark presence, and as uh, as Archaon and he are about to have his big showdown uh, from the shadows, uh, this guy right here, oh, 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 shows up and gets all sneaky. I believe this is uh, Lurklox who shows up, which is the Eshen Vermin Lord. And uh, he steps, the, the, the sneakiest of sneaky, sneaky vermin lords. And he steps up and very quickly just uh, slices off uh, Bolton's head. And uh, basically says, so die all who defy the will of the horned rat. And Martok sees this happen, can't warn him. Bolton falls dead, headless. And Archaon is, for his part, not thrilled about this outcome. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of that might be where I'll turn it back over to one of you. Yes. Well, yeah, I'll just slip in and I'll say that the Vermin Lord who appears there, because everybody gets a Vermin Lord as soon as they rise to some kind of power in Skavendom, um, this guy, his name was Dark Dwell. And uh, he was patron to. Uh, Skraslik, the guy that you mentioned earlier. He was the, the guy right, in charge yeah. of the Saving Besieging Forces. Um, he had decided earlier, though, that uh, Darkdwell did, that is, that he had served his purpose, his, his little minion, so he left him in the tunnels to die and wallow away with whatever goes on down there and came up to the surface to, to get his better purpose. And in this case, his better purpose is hacking off the head of Alton. And, uh, and that does it for him. So you're right, Archeon is a is a bit of a pissed off gentleman here at this point because he's just been his killed, his mark just got stolen from him in a way. Um, but across the across the plaza, we now have Martak, who's you know just seen his uh, his leader go down and. And, and again, it's it's um, taught emotions for the empire one more time, and he was tried to help, but he, as he said, he was too slow. He couldn't get there. My patron is gone. So then, of course, as you would expect in uh, in great movie cinematic ways, Martak snaps and he's like, "I'm gonna get you, you dirty chaos monkey," and starts to rush at him. So you have this guy in his robes and he's getting all of his Ulric rage going on. Um, and fires off his uh, his icy amber spears, but uh, Archeon is blocking those things with the shield, and he doesn't seem to be affected at all. And this one is really not even a battle. It's just quick work where Martak gets uh, skewered in some obscene way by Archeon and left in a puddle of his own goo. Um, and and that really is kind of the, the breaking point of it all. Um with a few flashy things, that's really all that Martak had here in the end. Fired some some icy shards, his amber spears, but none of it was any good. Um, Archeon took him out with a giggle, really, more than uh, is quite simple to say. And that, bre that breaks finally the spirit of all of the Empire soldiers. They get overrun in all kinds of ways. And that is the end of the City of the White Wolf. Yes, indeed. But but then it uh, so we have a lull, of course, at that moment in the story. Now that it's sort of come to that 
conclusion. Um, but we have a slip away to, to an area that we haven't been into for a long, long time. We slip away to Sylvania for a moment for a bit of an interlude. Um, Keith, you want to you take that one? Should we give that to you? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, yes, yeah, so we cut away to the Black Pyramid of the Gash all the way over in Sylvania, and Arkan is kind of pacing around because um, the Gash is having a bit of a nap and he didn't want her to disturb him. Um, but he eventually goes to Nagash, and from the darkness, these two pale little lights light up, and you know, Nagash is awake, and Dennis senses that another god is dead, or the, the winter god is dead and gone even beyond my reach. And I pauses again, and then Arkan is just silently kneeling in supplication, and then it kind of it describes how, you know, Arkan is perfectly happy to sit there for millennia, just waiting on, on his master. And then when Nagash speaks again, he says, Ready, my armies, the final battle is approaching. The chaos gods fear my power. So you know Nagash is a big deal when he can sense the chaos gods are fearing his power. And he's just one of the incarnates. Now he's a pretty, you know, he's not just an incarnate of death. He's also, you know, Nagash, who is only minorly imperfect. Uh, but when the gods of chaos fear your power, it's a pretty big deal. Um, so we know he's going to be a big player. He's getting the armies ready. Archon the Black is going to, you know, sum up some scallies. And, uh, yeah, he's going to make an advance on the Chaos Gods, you feel. Yeah, and that's the first we've heard of him since the Nagash book, uh, really, in its entirety. Um, so it's good to have a little bit of a nod back to, to, to give you the at least the idea or the, or the, or the sensibility or foreshadowing that, that he still might have a big part to play. Um, so they kind of slipped mm -hmm. that in there to, to give us that. Um, further on to this, there's a couple of little bits that, that talks about the aftermath of Middenheim. Um, primarily, it eventually word comes down to Aberheim, which is where Karl Franz went to after leaving Altdorf, that Middenheim has fallen. Or it comes to Karl Franz's ears anyway, and he, and he keeps it pretty private initially. Um, also, news travels to Atheloran, where at this point, all of the elves have gathered because Ulthman's sunken under the sea. And uh, the way that they can put it here is nobody cares about that in, in Elfland, uh, except for Liliath, who is involved with all the, all the machinations and, and plotting that uh, the Teclis has been involved in. So, so she feels that there's something greater there. Um, it also mentions the dwarfs here that uh, the news came to the almost entirely ignorant of the fall of Middenheim, but quite honestly, it doesn't matter to them anyway because they have too much of their own crap to deal with with Skaven on every doorstep and being overrun by orcs and goblins as well. Um, I'm trying to think if any if it touches on anybody else's feelings about that here, but uh, um, I don't. I don't. I think that's pretty much the the big ones. I think the only other note that comes to my mind is they mention that like more Skaven show up. They're drawn to the the war, even though the original claw packs were dead. And the army of Archeon is so vast that the city of Middenheim contains but a fraction of it. And really, they end up taking up the land all around it because just. His, his horde grows ever bigger. I mean, he lost almost nothing, really, in the battle. Yeah, they talk about uh, how that expands over a couple of miles, and they've had to cut down the forest to make room for them. And even the even the slave pens are acres and acres of, of, uh, of occupation to, to keep the slaves in there. There's um, well, the most here. Archeon's in his throne room, and he gets paid a little visit by Village the Kirkland. Yeah, we were gonna. We need to. That, that kind of wraps up the chapter. I was gonna give that to Vince to tell us about that exchange and and oh, yeah. us, uh, Go ahead, Vince. What's going on there? Uh, I'll give that one to Keith. I, Village is not one of my my people. I don't know enough about him for the past, so I, I will I will pass that one over to one of you, as Zinch has never been my my chosen guy. All right. All right. Well, um, so Archeon had ensconced himself in the in the defiled temple of Ulrich and it makes a really um, kind of interesting description of what he's done with the place as regards to decor. 
So you've got a bunch of hooks hanging from the ceiling where a bunch of bodies are suspended, and some of them are alive, and some of them are not so alive. And you've got all his swords of chaos arrayed. And uh, he's sitting on his massive throne, and beside him, in a very kind of Shakespearean manner, is a little skull, uh, which is the flanged skull of Valtan. Uh, and on the floor in front of him is the flayed remains of uh, Gregor Martak. Um, so he's making himself comfortable. And he's summoned to himself Village the Cursling. Now this guy is slipperier than the slipperiest skaven. Like this guy is just so slimy and two-faced and schemy, like it's beyond comprehension because of course he's a favorite of each. Um, so he is summoned, and Archeon makes him wait a little bit, and he eventually gets down and kneels and starts with all the platitudes, like, oh, you're the chosen, you're the greatest, the triadic king, blah, blah, blah. And Archeon just kind of, like, straight up goes, um, if I give you this mission, will you do it? And kind of Kairos, Fate Weaver, steps out from behind the throne and interject, and himself and Village, uh, like, Village answers and say, oh, my loyalties lie to the Chaos Gods and your cause, but because Beach is my patron, he is my first and foremost um, uh, loyalty. And then Kairos go back and forth, and basically Archeon, like, sees right through any of his platitudes and all that kind of stuff, and just kind of like, look, I know that you're self-serving, and I know that you would betray me you know, without a hint of hesitation because you've got all these many schemes that you can't even keep them straight. But I just want you to take Averheim because I've got some other things i got to do. And uh, with that, Village is kind of like, you know, Archeon is kind of um, is secure that, you know, Village can at least do this for him uh, and won't screw it up too much or, or twist it too much uh, that Archeon doesn't fulfill his purposes. The village gets up and leaves and basically he turns to Kairos and goes, well, he's kind of, he's your little wretch, he's your minion, do you want to go with him, or are you going to stay with me? And then Kairos kind of disappears into most of color, uh, presumably to go with Village to Aberheim. You can't trust that guy. <laughs> yeah, so, so the, in the conclusion of this, I guess the things that I picked out of it was that although he makes village subservient and tells him to go do the job, but he really reinforces the point, do not dare kill Carl Franz, because Carl Franz is mine. Mm -hmm. So you can rise the whole rest of the city, will you keep that guy for me? Um, otherwise, you're, you're in for you know an eternity of pain. Um, and then the other thing that, that we get here is a little bit of, uh, a little bit of battle of wills. Um, the first person to, to battle any wills with Archaeon is Kairos Fateweaver. So they have a little bit of back and forth there where you think that they're sort of wrestling for for, for dominance in that throne room, I guess. Mm -hmm. okay. well, the other thing that happens, which I'm not sure if it's going it, to... It doesn't seem significant right now, but it could be. But Archeon puts his hand on Village and basically brands him. So I don't know if that's going to affect anything coming forward, but maybe it's just a taste of things to come if he fails. Yeah. Yeah, and then the closing moment is Archeon grabs a hold of his little flint skull of Vaulton and just squeezes it until it crumbles into dust. All the while thinking about what he's going to do to Carl Franz and the Empire. So, well, that's kind of how it all closes for the chapter, boys and girls. Um, Vince, did you have any other final thoughts you wanted to pump in with? Um. In the uh, in the insult battle that goes back and forth between Archaon and Kairos, uh, as though it's some form of like street rap battle, Archaon definitely comes out on the top. He's got the much better brand of insults. Zinch might be the master of uh, of lies, but Archaon is the master of sick burns. Uh, when when he says uh, when he says he is your creature, Fate Weaver, will you follow him, or has your brush with the Wolf Wizard dimmed your enthusiasm for battle? Like that's such a good burn. You're a Lord of Change, and you got taken out by some some beast wizard. Uh, yeah, so it's that's not uh, yeah, exactly. Like it's so it's so nice, and uh, yeah, I I like their inner there. I like the two of them talking quite a bit. I think they have a nice exchange. And then obviously we get the hint of the blood god uh, on the edge of, of uh, Archaon's mind. That's sort of the last parting thought 
is that uh, a particular god of the Force seems to weigh very heavily upon the mind of Archaon as he stands here in his temple. Mm -hmm. So tune in later when Archaon appears on Yo Mama with Wilmer Valderrama to bring on all comers and bring them down. <laughs> he would win in a heartbeat. Yeah, but but for now, I think we're gonna we're gonna sign off there and bring it close to chapter six of Thankwall, the End Times. Good night, everybody. Grigor Martak could feel something terrible gathering upon the winds of magic, a malignant presence that grew stronger by the second. Fighting his way back through the scrum of panicking soldiers towards the source, he saw Archaon looming over Alvalta. For a moment, he stared at the frozen tableau, the Herald of Sigmar standing resolute upon the steps of Ulrich's temple, the Lord of the End Times raising his blade to strike him down. Part of Martak's mind was still hunting for the sorcerer's fault, yet now his rational thoughts were buried beneath Ulrich's avalanche of fury as the god spark behind the ever chosen before the very steps of his temple. Stay your hand, servant of ruin, roared Martak. Ulrich's booming voice interwoven with his own. This is my city. You will despoil it with your foul presence no longer. Ignoring the wizard, Archaon aimed another ferocious cut at his foe, the Herald of Sigmar knocked, sprawling back to the steps. At that moment, from the corner of his eye, Martok saw the shadows of the temple doorway solidify. The sense of wrongness focused upon that point, an ancient evil bursting through the weave of the ancient world itself. Where before had been empty space, now there was something vast and verminous. Martok's eyes widened with the glint of a wicked blade. Valtin, at your back! His warning seemed to roll from his tongue with the treacle slow speed of a nightmare. The Herald of Sigmar, still hauling himself back to his feet, began to turn. Martak grasped for a spell, but both moved too slowly, far too slowly. The Vermin Lord's triple blade hissed as it whipped through the air and struck Valtin cleanly in the neck. The Herald of Sigmar's noble head tumbled from his shoulders, eyes wide with shock. Martak's cry of horror mingled with Archaon's roar of outrage as Valtin's lifeless body crumpled to the steps. From the shadows came a hissing voice, its sound like the scurrying of myriad rats. So die all who defy the will of the Horn Rat.